We've always been committed to generational relevance here at FaithBridge, connecting the soul-saving, life-changing gospel truth of Jesus with every generation. We've been committed to that from the very start, going way back to the, to the beginning when there was just several dozen of us that were meeting in that home. Even then, we only had four or five kids, but I knew if we're going to be a church that makes an impact in this community, in the suburbs, we're gonna have to connect with every age of children and youth. And it was right about then I met a guy named Ben Stewart, who was a college kid getting ready to graduate from Texas A&M. The interview process was funny because I don't think Ken really knew what to say and me neither. So we were looking at each other and he's like, you wanna work here? I'm like, I guess. Like, but I don't know that anyone would say, hey, if you're planning a church, your first hire should be a youth pastor. I, that's not in any book. That doesn't make sense. Did every way I step into it go great? No. So within about the first four months, I had gotten our five students and six leaders. I grew it to like one kid and no leaders. So just bang and start. I had, didn't know how to be a youth pastor, but I knew the Bible and I knew how to care about people. And it dawned on me when John was trying to summarize Jesus, he kept saying he was full of grace and truth. And I thought, that's what we got. I can legitimately love you and I can present you the truth. And so I remember we finally got these Bible studies started. And what I would do is just print off on a piece of paper, a little chunk of one of the gospels. And I remember sitting there and there was this one kid, a guy had brought a friend and the friend said, I can't believe we're doing this. We're like, what? And he was like, we're just reading the Bible and explaining it. And he goes, man, I've never seen anything like this. I'm telling everybody. I was like, okay. And we started to grow, man. We outgrew this little apartment we were in and had to move to kind of the central kind of hub of this apartment complex. And on it began to grow because we didn't have all the bells and whistles, man, but we had sincere love and we had truth. And you got those two things and that's, that's the foundation that church grows on. And he grew that fledgling student ministry from five up to a dozen and two dozen. And one day the guy handed me a piece of paper um, that I would get at the end of every Sunday. And it said 76 youth were down in that choir room. The legacy that was started back then continues today with our commitment being to connecting these kids that are coming up with the gospel of Jesus in a way that transforms their lives. It is one of the most rewarding things to see transformation in a student, whether that is over a long period of time and there are slow drips of things that you can see that change month by month or year to year, or if it is a more of a life altering turnaround where they experience Jesus in a new and fresh way, either one is just so rewarding and life-giving because they get excited about it. So you can't help but be excited for them and be a part of that. It's so, so, so great. I know when I was a youth pastor, I had several parents come to me just in tears, thanking me for loving their kid. And I didn't understand it at the time as a single guy. I was like, yeah, sure, man. But now I understand it as a parent. I'm like, if someone came alongside to help me love my kid and know the truth of God, I'd be forever grateful. And so that's part of it is I'm, I'm helping this family answer some of their kids' specific questions and challenges. Another thing though is sometimes you've got some kids that aren't interested in church, but if you can create an avenue that's speaking directly to their heart needs, speaking directly to their issues, they'll go, I wanna, I need to go there. They're answering my questions. My friends are there and they're helping me. And sometimes that can anchor families that are maybe iffy on if they show up to church. And then on the other side, you've got some kids that their family's not going to church. And people talk about that in the culture today. People are growing less religious, churches are shrinking. But we found that if you create a robust youth ministry, now all of a sudden, you've got some kids that love Jesus that can invite that lost friend. And it's a way to have a mission onto the campus. And if you wanna change the lives of people, get to them when they're asking those big questions, when they're young people. We want them to exit our doors as seniors in high school, people that are being launched into the world. We want them to be people who have a foundational understanding of faith, but also an independence in their faith to where when they go to college, they're not easily um, shaken. 
they walk into that sphere and realize, okay, this is where I now put all of this into place and it's my faith. We want them to just have, honestly, starting in sixth grade, a trajectory into what their future is going to be. And what's really exciting and fulfilling is to see some of those original kids from 20 years ago now have gotten married and have their own kids and now their kids are coming into the program and starting the process themselves where we're living out this generational relevance, connecting their souls to Jesus as well. There were a lot of things I did not do great as a youth pastor of Faithbridge. Shooting donuts at kids with a skeet thrower, not my best idea. But one of the things I'm proud of in the past of Faith Bridge's youth ministry is what Paul told Timothy. The goal of our instruction is love. That we said we want to teach people about Jesus and the end goal, not that they have more Bible head knowledge, but that they love God more as a result of our influence and love people more as a result of our teaching. That's what we're meant to do. The world can entertain them better, but that can give them the two things they can't get anywhere else, the godly love and the truth of God's word. That's the great legacy, I think, from the early days. And when I think about the future of Faith Bridge, what I hope is true of the youth ministry is that it would excel at delivering the truth in love. Yay, that's fun, honey. I didn't get to see that until yesterday evening and I texted him and said, I'm so glad you didn't tell me about the donuts that you were doing back then. <laughs> well, goodness, the, the, the student ministry that was started 20 years ago is just going so well, alive and well, better than ever. Uh, really and truly, and if you want proof, all you have to do on any Sunday morning is just go upstairs over on the west side and go to the loft or go to the launch pad and you will see hundreds of kids or come up here on a Wednesday evening and you'll see kids everywhere and it'll just make your day. It's awesome to see what God is doing here. So I should say welcome and good morning in both rooms. And I should also say happy anniversary because today represents 20 years since we had our first lunch service at the Club Intermediate School. So praise the Lord. And just because I'm curious, um, in this room and in East, if you were here back in the early day back then, would you just stand up right now? Because I just want to see you and say thank you. And we should say thank you to them as well. Why don't you say thank you? You guys stepped out. And I sure do appreciate that, that you did. We knew uh, back then that we were going to have to start a different kind of church to reach people who were skeptical and cynical and unchurched and de-churched and badly churched and as well as churched and people who loved Jesus. And uh, that was 20 years ago. And the best is yet to come. So take your Bible and let's go to Matthew chapter 14. And if you need a Bible in either room, the ushers are coming right now, and they'll hand out a Bible to you if you'll just wave your hand, and you can follow along if you like. You can keep the Bible. It's our gift to you if you need a Bible. So we'll go to Matthew 14 in just a moment. One of my favorite characters in the whole Bible is the character Peter, because in so many ways I identify with the qualities that we see in that man. He could get carried away in the moment, and so could I. Sometimes he was hot-headed, even impulsive. So am I. But he loved and wanted to follow Jesus, and so do I. So I want to look at one of these great moments in his life. Life, a defining moment that we see here in Matthew chapter 14. So let me read it to you, starting in verse 22, 14, 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray, Jesus did. Later that night, he was there all alone. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. 
Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. They cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. And Peter replied, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Oh, you of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? So Peter and his friends, the disciples, have gotten into a boat at Jesus' instruction to head across the Sea of Galilee. It's not a big lake, I think about 13 miles long and about six miles wide. And so it's not really a sea so much as it is a lake. And they were boating without Jesus this day because Jesus needs some time alone, time to himself, time with the Father um, up in the mountainside, and so he's going to stay there. And, uh, but Peter knew uh, the Sea of Galilee Lake Gennesaret, as it's also called. He knew it like the back of his hand. And so he was a fisherman after all, and, and he liked boats. He'd been on them his whole life. But as is prone to happen on that sea, which is set within sort of a hillish mountainous setting, sort of like in a bowl the Sea of Galilee is, and therefore it's prone to one of these storms came in real strong. Matthew says that the, the waters were, the boat was tormented by the waves, meaning the disciples were just trying to keep this fishing boat upright. And so at some point, you know that their focus surely shifted from merely getting to the other side to now just staying alive. And finally, somewhere, we know from the original language this happened, somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. in the fourth watch of the night, they look out in the darkness and they see a shadow moving towards them. And they're convinced it's a ghost and they cry out, in the original language, they cry out, phantasma, which you get the word phantom from it. But then that ghost identifies himself and says, no, it is I, Jesus says. Don't be afraid. Which brings us to the first of four things that I want you to jot down today, particularly if you're a note taker. Here's the first one. Look out. You got to look out, particularly in the storms of your life. Because Jesus has always had a way of showing up in the storms when they're tumultuous in our lives. It's often right in the midst of a loss or in the death of a dream or a person. It's often right when you're feeling the storm of loneliness and hopelessness. Right when it feels like the waters are coming over the edge and threatening to capsize you. It's often right about then that believers for centuries have said that is when Jesus showed up and I felt his presence like never before because Jesus has always specialized in storms. He stands on top of the water in the midst of our storms. You know why Jesus shows up so much in storms? Because that's often where we realize our need for him the most. That's the point at which we're the most ready to receive him into our lives. Haven't you ever been desperate for an answer from God yourself? Some of you, you're there right now. You're like, that is my life right now in this very season. I know I was feeling that a little more than 20 years ago as I was barreling towards the completion of my doctoral program in Kentucky all of my colleagues knew exactly where they were going to be going and what they're going to be doing when we finished in June. 
except me. I was the only one I didn't know. It's not that I hadn't gotten some nice invitations or some nice people said, would you come start a church with us in Alabama and another one in California and another one in Calgary, Canada, Burr. And, but none of them felt right. And so here I was with all of my colleagues knowing where they're going and talking about it. And it was March and we only had 70 or 80, 90 more days. And I felt like the train was pulling out of the station and I wasn't on the train. And I was really wrestling with this. Why, God, are you not showing me? And I was fretting and worrying and losing sleep over it and waiting for him to tell me. And then I remember one night all alone, tossing and turning, unable to sleep, I asked the Lord again, Lord, what is it that you're going to have me do? I've got to know but there was nothing just silence and so I asked again and still silence and finally I remember just putting my head back on the pillow of my bed looking up at the ceiling and saying well Lord whatever it is that you want me to do I will do it if you'll just tell me and just as I started to close my eyes he planted the phrase right on my heart I'm going to call you to start a new work. And I lurched up and said, was that you? You're going to call me? Am I going to do a new thing? I wanted the opportunity to plant a new church. And sure enough, just a couple of days later, the first phone call and another and a series of things that would lead to eventually things getting rolling here in Northwest Houston. The storm wasn't over, but I'd spotted Jesus in the midst of the darkness, and I'd heard from him. But after you've heard from him, after you've gotten a nudging or an impression from him, you can't just sit on it. That leads to the second thing that we learn from this text. And that is, you got to step out. You got to look out and then you got to step out. Now, put yourself in Peter's story, okay? Nobody had ever heard the expression, not back then, well, he just thinks he can walk on water because nobody had ever done that before. So that wasn't an expression anybody used. Let's not rush through this, though. Picture in your mind the size of the waves that were just pushing up against that little fishing boat, and it's dark, and the water is splashing in, and there's wind, and, and they're tossing and turning, and there's no Dramamine not back then. And these were conditions that they were in. And Peter, in the midst of those conditions, not still smooth water, but terrible water, he's going to climb up over the rail and do the unthinkable. He's going to let go of what seems to be giving him the most security. And he's going to step out towards Jesus. In seeing the video of Ben, I couldn't help be a little uh, sentimental in thinking um, back to just a couple of years ago. Um, At this point, he had left Breakaway and he was uh, nesting in Atlanta and trying to figure out um, along with Louis Giglio, where he was supposed to go. And, and, but I'll confess to you, a handful of us back here, we knew, well, that's all just perfunctory. Of course, he's coming back to Houston. And <clears throat> so, but I think he was calling at least weekly, sometimes more than weekly, just to process. You know, we just went to L.A., and now we just went to New York City, and now we just went to Miami, and we went to D.C. And I would listen and, you know, reflect back to him and ask him questions. And But deep down, I was like, yeah, this is all perfunctory. We all know you're coming back to Houston. Of course, that's the way it should be. And so you can imagine my shock That day when at the lunch table at the Chinese restaurant, Ben and Donna leaned over and said, we're going to D.C. And I said, D.C.? I said, do you know anybody there? (laughs) And they said, no. I said, do you have any contacts there? No. They interrupted. They said, but Ken, it's a city filled with 
young people. It, it feels in many ways like College Station because there's so many young people there getting a start on their life. And we just feel like that's the place for us to go. And just about when I was starting to say, let's not be too rash. And right about that point, Ben says, Ken, I've heard you tell the story dozens of times of how you moved to Northwest Houston and you didn't have anything, but you had Jesus. I've heard you tell that story about how you stepped out on faith and how you were scared. And if we came back to Houston, that won't be our story. Our story would just be easy. I want to have a story of stepping out and depending upon Jesus and trusting him the way that you did. And at that I had to say, then of course you have to go to D.C. It's going to be wonderful. And we're going to support you from here. And our nation's capital surely needs a great church. They're not but three or four, they'd explained to me. Houston has a lot, as he pointed out. I said, you've got to go. It will be a marvelous thing. And by the way, just so you can know and rejoice with those who are rejoicing, if you're not following him, they'll be celebrating their first anniversary at the Passion City Church in D.C. this Easter. And would you believe they already have a 1,000 people coming there every week. And they're going to go to three services. And so I'm saying, I think you're going to need to think about a different theater, maybe with a few more seats. Um, and so praise the Lord for the things that are going on um, there. Now, if he hadn't stepped out, if they hadn't gone there and just grabbed the rope and yelled Geronimo, those things couldn't be happen, happening. Those thousand people and more wouldn't be coming and connecting in the stories that are coming out of people whose lives are being changed wouldn't be happening. Now, let's bring it closer to home. Some of you right here, you talk a good game about stepping out on faith, but you keep staying in your boat. You do. John Ortberg, to whom I'm indebted for a number of thoughts in the message here, he writes, your boat, you know what your boat is? Your boat is whatever represents safety and security to you apart from God himself. Your boat is whatever you're tempted to put your trust in, especially when it gets a little bit stormy. That's your boat. Your boat's whatever keeps you so comfortable that you don't want to give it up. Your boat's whatever pulls you away from the high adventure of extreme discipleship. So just ask, what is it that most produces fear inside of me, especially if I think of leaving it behind and stepping out away from it, and you probably just identified what your boat is? What's yours? What's your boat? For some of you, I think it's your job. You don't particularly love your job, but it gets the bills paid and gets the job done. And in any number of times, even recently, you've thought, maybe I should go and do that. You've even wondered, is the Lord nudging me to go and, and do that? But the thought of making a change is just so frightening, you just sort of buckle down and sit in the boat and you just say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. And you keep sitting in your boat. And for others of you, it's your success or it's your money. And you know deep down that the Spirit's been nudging you. You have things you could be generous with. And you could support that ministry or that church or that orphanage or whatever it is. But every time you think about doing something very generous, you're like, yeah, but what if this happens and then I better just hang on to it. As if it could save you in this world that's crumbling around us. You're not stepping out. You just keep sitting in your boat. And for others of you, you need to step out and let go of maybe some bitterness, some terrible grudge holding. You're just sort of anchored in that posture. You just keep sitting in that boat instead of stepping out of that into freedom. 
and going towards Jesus. Step out. Others of you still, you're hanging on to a relationship and yet you know this relationship's not right, it's a dysfunctional relationship or it's an abusive relationship or it's an ungodly relationship and you know that the Lord's been saying, come on, step away from that. But you panic and you think, eh, but then I wouldn't have anybody so I'll just stay in it, wrong. You would have Jesus and there's nothing better than him. Step out. So what's your boat? In what area of your life are you shrinking back from courageously stepping over the rail and really trusting him? This I know. If you ever want to walk on water, you're going to have to get out of the boat. Just doesn't work otherwise. I bet for a few seconds it surely felt as if Peter and Jesus were the only two in the whole sea. Just having a moment between them, Peter beaming with delight as he's moving towards Jesus. Jesus thrilled with his student, like master, like disciple, until Peter gets distracted and looks around and surely thinks to himself, what am I doing? How did I get myself into this? Which leads to the third thing you should jot down. After you look out for Jesus, after you step out towards Jesus, you can expect to freak out. <laughs> it's very predictable. The text says Peter saw the wind. In other words, he stopped looking at Jesus and he started looking at everything else swirling around him. And all of us can do that, don't we? You start in maybe on a new adventure full of hope. Maybe it's a new job or maybe it's a new uh, way of serving and using your spiritual gift or doing a, a new sort of ministry and, and, and you're excited and, and just caught up in what's going on and it's all blue skies until you hit your first bumps, until you meet some opposition. And then all of a sudden reality sets in and, and walking by faith now becomes very frightening and you panic and you say what am I doing like the night that many of you heard me tell about when several months into this new experiment called faith bridge I woke up in a cold terrified sweat panic stricken thinking about the several dozen people who are in some of those pictures that we were looking at and thinking of their excitement and thinking about how seriously they were taking this and they'd even met with their small groups or even their pastors of the churches that they'd come from to get blessings and they'd come to be missionaries and we were in it together and I'm thinking to myself I don't know what we're doing and it was that night I was lying in bed and I started practicing my shutter down speech. The shutter down speech, that was going to come next Sunday. And I was going to say, well, everybody, all of us have these moments in life that we just have to categorize as whoops moments. And I think this has been one. And I'm terribly sorry, but I'm already working on calling the people at the church in the woodlands where I was, and I'm sure they're going to take me back. And I'm sure wherever you came from, they'll take you back too. And so this has been great, but that's all, folks. You know, and, and so it was right about then I felt like the Spirit of God said to my spirit, well, aren't you going to talk with me any about this before you just shut her down? And it was right as I began to pray, I felt his peace that surpasses all understanding that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Freak out moment tends to happen anytime we're following after Jesus. You can pretty well just take that to the bank. Once you've looked out, once you've stepped out, you're going to freak out. But 20 years later, I'm really glad I didn't quit the things that wouldn't have happened if I had, which leads to the fourth and final move in our text, reach out. When you're in that freak out moment, there's only one thing to do, and that is to reach out. 
verse 30 said, but when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And you can just picture in your mind's eye, Peter's arm, sort of like a baby reaching for the mom or dad in a swimming pool, just reaching out. And immediately it says in verse 31, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. So the other night, uh, we were having dinner uh, with some friends, and one of them uh, turned to me at a point in the conversation and said, so what are you preaching about on Sunday? I said, I'm preaching about Peter walking on the water. And he said, ah, the scene where Peter failed. And I thought about it for a quick second, and I said, well, that's one way to look at it. On the other hand, I bet he walked on more water than you ever have. <laughs> It's all how you look at it. How, did, did Peter fail? No, I don't think he failed at all. Not any more than a little child who's learning how to walk. And when they get up to four steps and up to five steps and they, then they did Peter over, do you go up and say you failure? No, you're like, you did five of them. Oh my gosh. And it's a happy moment because you're making progress. You're growing and that's what Peter was doing. He was growing in that moment. And incidentally, you will fail. You all, all of us, all, you will fall. <laughs> we even have a verse that assures us, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us like sheep have gone astray. All of us have sinned and all of us have fallen short. But there again, we see God's great mercy and God's great love in that while we were yet sinners, he sent us his son, Jesus, to live the life of sinless perfection that we could never live so that he then could die the death of punishment that we all deserved so that then he could conquer the grave on the third day that we would never have hope of conquering so that by putting our trust and our faith in him, we could have the assurance of life through Jesus. So gratefully, our story doesn't end when we fall, we move from there to the gospel. So let me ask you, where are you now in all of this today? Sometimes when we come to a story like this, I think we, we tend to divorce ourselves a little bit from the character in scripture. And we tend to, to sort of say, well, you know what? I'm not like he was. I'm kind of an ordinary person. You gotta remember, <laughs> that's the whole point. Peter was an ordinary person. He was just a smelly, stinky, ordinary fisherman whom Jesus had said, I want you to follow me. At this point in his life, I guarantee you nobody to even to wager a hamburger that he would be fit to be enshrined in stained glass windows of churches all around the world. Nobody was placing bets on Peter. No, not back then. He had no glow about his head. There was nothing except he was just like you. Or you're just like him. But he was willing to take the next step. How about you? You willing to take the next step? What's your next step with Jesus? Where's he calling you? What's he been nudging you or beckoning you towards. I'll tell you why this matters. This is the reason this matters because we don't get to move further into the will and the blessing of God until we act first upon the will that he has shown us. Until we say yes to the instruction that he's already given. You don't get to bypass and say, I'll pass on that one. What's the next one you got for it? It's not the way it works. That's why this matters so much. And so I realize, I know, it's more comfortable just to sit in a boat and to seek a world of comfort that we, all of us are guilty of trying to construct for ourselves. We want the manageable life and we want to buy into the illusion that we really are in control and insulated with security and, and predictability. But 
It's not so. Even entire churches can drift into this mentality. Look at what we've done. So let's just settle back comfortably at this point. Let's just coast. We can't do that as a church either. We're not going to do that either because God has so much more for us yet to do in the next 20 years, particularly as we invest in the next generations coming along, which brings me to one last thing that I wanted to say. As we look ahead towards what God wants from us and through us these next 20 years, I want to give you a sneak peek into some things that the lead team and the lay elders have been working on for months, collaborating about, interviewing about, dreaming about, as we consider what would be the best way to connect with the next generation of people who are coming along. We're trying to figure out how would that happen best. In the same way that I told some of you 20 years ago, we're going to have to do things differently if we're going to reach people in this day and age. The same is true even today. We're going to have to do things differently if we're going to reach people in this day and age. And so we've got to look ahead and figure out what would that be. This is where I need your help. Because we feel like our collective work in these teams that I described to you has brought forth a lot of good, good ideas, but we need feedback now. We need to know what do you think as you come into to the processes that we've been thinking about. Are you feeling like, yes, we're on track here. I need feedback from you. And so here's what I want to do. I want you to pull out your phone right now, and I'm going to tell you how you can get a, a little document that you can just look at. And then we're going to start doing some surveying here uh, in several weeks just to get your feedback about it. So pull out your, your, do this in both rooms, east center court as well as west, okay? Pull out your phones. You have permission to use your phone right now in church, all right? So, so um, the document is called Generation 2020. And there's several different ways you could get it. You can go on to the FaithBridge app. If you have the app, just open the app and just, you'll see Generation 2020. You can just press it and there it is. Okay, you don't have to read it like right now, but you can do that this afternoon or this evening, okay? Or uh, you could text uh, uh, FB2020 to 797979, okay? And uh, you could get it that way. Or if you're watching online right now, you can just go online, faithbridge.org slash FB2020, okay? Or if you're in either room here present today, you can just go and you want a hard copy, you can just walk out to the, to the uh, Connection Center and you can get one of those um, on your way out today. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to look it through and pray about it with us. Because in the coming weeks, like I said, we're going to start doing some surveying uh, to a number of you, and, and we're going to ask you to speak into this as we continue to work on our plans for the next 20 years of Faith Bridge. So friends, defining moments, they come in all of our lives, defining moments do. And faith is simply taking the next step. And so I say, let's take that step of faith in our individual lives and as a church as well. Let's step towards Jesus. Let's do it together. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for um, a guy like Peter who was willing to uh, leave behind what was familiar and what felt safe because he caught a glimpse of you and better and more. And Lord, that's what I want to pray for us here today, that we likewise would catch a glimpse of what it is that you want to do in each of our lives, first on the individual level, Lord, because I do have a sense that there's any number of us who we're, we're sitting in the boat 
and even some of us while we were sitting here today, we know exactly what our boat is. And yet we keep cling, cling, clinging on to the, to the sides. Lord, would you give us faith even today to stand up and say, I'm going to step out now. And I pray, God, the same for us as a, as a church. You know, Lord, we've been working very hard behind the scenes, but now we need feedback. We need to know, are we hearing right? Is this the right thing? God, I pray that, that you would speak, even as you did back in the day when we were exploring what property would be the right property and we would have the prayer walks out here and we'd ask everybody, what do you feel like the Lord's saying? Won't you lead us once again, Lord, and make your way, your path straight for us? And friend, if you're here and you haven't even said yes to Jesus in the first place, then that's the first thing you, you must do right now is just say, I want you, Jesus, to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins. I want that good news. I want that gospel to come into me that I might be a gospel person living with gospel hope, good news of forgiveness and life. Lord, thanks for the things that you're doing. Won't you put your blessing on each of us and give us the courage that we need to keep stepping towards you. And we pray it all in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>